I heard the name Donegal probably a hundred times before I knew where it was on a map. Because when I joined the roadshow and started working with the Vote No campaign, I kept on asking people where they were from. And at one point, half of the people on the bus were all from here. Before, uh, before I get started, Mr. Hart's incredible speech reminded me of a story from uh, where I'm from in Canada that some of you may find interesting, and he made the point that abortion isn't health care, and that when they call abortion health care, fundamentally they're gaslighting us. And during the debates in the 1980s in Canada, a uh, pro-life doctor came into town and went on one of the major television stations to debate Canada's abortion pioneer, uh, Dr. Henry Morgenthaler. And partway through the debate, uh, Henry Morgenthaler said, excuse me, sir, as a doctor, and the pro-life doctor stopped him and said, I'm sorry, Mr. Morgenthaler, you were not a doctor, you were an abortionist. So it's so wonderful to be with you because after May 25th and after doing so much research into the Irish pro-life movement because I was so impressed and so moved by what I saw happen here and the more I learned about the movement the more I felt the story really did have to be told because there's only one narrative that we got in Canada on the CBC that they got in the US and the New York Times uh, that they got in the UK on the BBC and that was this narrative of a handful of plucky progressives and feminists dragging Ireland kicking and screaming into modernity and that the loss of the Eighth Amendment was the final evidence of that fact but what I found here was that tens of thousands of people had put boots on the ground every day in a country where abortion wasn't even legal and that their commitment had resulted in hundreds of thousands of lives being saved over 35 years. And I thought that story really was worth telling because it's very easy to focus on the tragedy of May 25, 2018. But an important cure for despair is to recognize that all of that hard work was not for nothing. All of those days out canvassing, all of those days out going door to door, all of those days having arguments you didn't feel like having, those meant that 250,000, a quarter of a million babies who otherwise would have ended up in trash cans or flushed down toilets were instead welcomed into their mother's arms. And that is something I think that you all should be incredibly proud of. There are some historical parallels that I discovered while researching the book that I found really interesting. And one of the most interesting parallels is particularly relevant to our current historical moment. Because on January 22, 1973, when a handful of American Supreme Court justices declared that abortion was a constitutional right in all 50 states, based on a collection of medical misinformation, historical mythology, and outright deceit, this was noticed by a handful of activists here in Ireland. And they noticed this because the US Supreme Court used a right to privacy to say that abortion was a fundamental right. This right to privacy had been invented some years before in the Griswold versus Connecticut case to legalize contraception. And again, this right had been sort of conjured out of thin air based on the idea of a living constitution. And we in this room know that when we hear about a constitution that is living, they are usually written by people who do not think a baby in the womb is living. And so there's this schizophrenia about what has life and what does not. Well, on December 29, 1973, later that year, the Irish Supreme Court ruled in favor of Mary McGee, also in a contraception case, and some of the judges referred to a living constitution. And at that point, these prescient Irish pro-life activists realized that despite the fact that Ireland had always been pro-life, despite the fact that it was taken for granted that abortion was and should be illegal, a handful of judicial elites could decide, based on an ideology they invented 15 minutes ago, 
to remove these protections on a whim, and that they had to do something to respond to this. And the campaign they began forming then, at the end of 1973 already, that would culminate 10 years later in the Eighth Amendment in 1983, marks the Irish movement out as the only movement in the Western world that developed not in response to abortion being legalized, but developed because they saw the threat coming and launched a preemptive strike. One Irish journalist very bitterly put it, uh, he said the 1983 pro-life campaign was, quote, one of the great political coups of the 20th century, which I thought was a great line and a great compliment, but it wasn't intended as such. And so what we saw then is that the Irish pro-life movement's prescience launched that country into being a light to the rest of the world for 35 years. People from other countries, like myself, have long looked to Ireland and admired, admired what you accomplished here. And when I got to work with the pro-life movement, I grew to greatly admire those who had ensured that the Eighth Amendment was kept. Because many pro-lifers in many countries would think abortion's illegal, our work here is done. But the Irish were working just as hard when abortion was illegal as many pro-lifers were working in countries uh, where it was actually legal. It's really unbelievable. And so I, I share with you that sense of loss from afar as a member of sort of the international pro-life family. But there is, as Neve mentioned, good news that has happened recently as well. Because in 2022, the Eighth Amendment is gone, but so is Roe v. Wade. Just as the birth of Roe v. Wade was a wake-up call to Irish pro-lifers and resulted in an amendment that saved a quarter of a million lives, the death of Roe v. Wade is also a wake-up call and it is a reminder that battles lost do not yet mean that the war is lost. Now think about the gravity of what actually took place in June when the U.S. Supreme Court justices declared in a 6-3 vote there is no constitutional right to abortion. Now, sometimes I think not all pro-lifers felt the sheer shock and historical magnitude of that phrase because it's what we've believed all along. So people are reading the newspaper and thinking, thank you for catching up with us. We knew that already. But for the first time in the history of the post-sexual revolution West, the judicial elites of a country after 48 years of affirming abortion as a constitutional right, after 60 million aborted babies, said no. And for the first time, we realized that what was done could be undone. That just because something was made legal does not mean it can't be made I illegal. I was watching all the press releases roll out from all the pro-life groups in the 24 hours following the Dobbs decision in June, and a dozen states declared protections for the pre-born in 24 hours. It was one of the wildest days of my life, because I, I, even though I hoped, I never thought that I would actually see that happen, and I know many pro-lifers who fought for that day who didn't see it happen, like the great Joe Scheidler, who visited you many times in Ireland. He died a year and a half a year and a half before the work of his entire life was accomplished, and he didn't get to see that day himself, but with a bunch of other pro-lifers, I was in front of the Supreme Court when the corpse of Roe was still fresh, watching the abortion protesters rage at the front of the court, and I represented him and all of those others while I was there, because the reason we can see the light at the end of the tunnel is because we stand on the shoulders of the giants who have gone before us. Now, what was interesting is, is in the weeks following Roe v. Wade collapsing, uh, I found myself enjoying reading the mainstream media. The New York Times was suddenly pleasant to read. Uh, the Guardian was actually sufferable for the first time in years. And it's because they were all panicking. And there was this real sense of desperation. They were saying, if Roe v. Wade can fall, what else is possible? And I thought, what a pleasant question. What else might be possible? 
Indeed, after almost a half century of legalized slaughter, in the country where the sexual revolution began, in the world's reigning superpower, if it can happen there, where else can it happen? Because we know that a lot of awful things begin in America. The sexual revolution, for example, most of the woke garbage that has infected the universities across the Western world began there. But what ha happens in America does spread around the world. And that's why suddenly, for the first time, mainstream journalists were concerned. We didn't mean that. There was articles, again, this is an article in The Guardian. It was a great article. They interviewed abortion activists in African countries like Nigeria. They interviewed abortion activists in Latin and South America. And all these abortion activists were saying, this could destroy everything we've done. It's emboldened pro-lifers around the world. It's given them a renewed sense of hope and defiance. And further to that, politicians who were open to listening to us on this are now suddenly looking at the United States and thinking, well, this doesn't all look that set in stone anymore, does it? Because what happened when Roe fell was that the myth of inevitability fell with it. And you all experienced that here in Ireland during the referendum, right? The media, especially the foreign media, like to say, when Ireland falls, it will finally be evidence that the march of progress goes in one direction. And it goes towards abortion legalization. It goes to accepting all of the excesses of the sexual revolution. It goes away from those who believe that human beings in the womb have the same right to life as their parents. But when Roe fell, suddenly that inevitability myth was gone. It was aborted, you might say. And it gave us hope and gave us recognition that real things could happen. And let me share a few examples with you of why I'm not just saying that because I have to say that. Because I'm a pro-life activist and I need to believe it because every single day in Canada and the U.S. we're on the streets talking to people about abortion, reaching out in front of clinics. Let's look at the example of Poland. How many of you saw the coverage of the riots in Warsaw after the Polish Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to kill a baby with a disability? Right? It was front pages everywhere. They really wanted to believe that Poland was just like Ireland in 2018 or Northern Ireland shortly thereafter. And what's interesting is that once those riots subsided, we didn't hear much about it afterwards. And so I started doing some digging, and I did some interviews, and what I found was really, really fascinating. Because Poland under communism became increasingly pro-abortion. But actually, only 22% of Polish people support abortion on demand. Despite the fact that The Guardian had led me to believe that number was much, much larger, and that all of them were packing the streets of Krakow and Warsaw, in their rage that you could no longer kill a baby with Down syndrome in the womb. Let me give you a number that shows how possible it is to rebuild a culture of life that has been lost. In 1992, when communism fell, 47% of Polish people believed that abortion should be legal for financial reasons. In 2016, that number had fallen to 14%. From 47% to 14 percent. And the reason this example and some other ones I'll cite for you are so important is because it shows that once a culture of life has been lost, it can be rebuilt. And those telling you it can't be rebuilt, that we had a vote, it's all over, you know for a fact that if Ireland had voted no by a narrow margin, you would have had at least one more referendum already by now. Right? When they lose, it's time for another referendum. When they win, it's time for everybody to shut up and go home. Your work here is done. And that's because they don't want what happened in Poland to happen in Ireland as well. They want to persuade all of you that nothing you do means anything because they won already. Don't go door to door. Don't talk to your neighbors. Don't expose the lies that we now know for a fact were lies that they told during the 2018 referendum and afterwards because they need you to be quiet because they know that things can change. Look at Roe. Look at Poland. Look at Malta, which is still holding strong. I interviewed uh, Dr. George Vela a while ago. He's the president of Malta, and he said he would rather resign the presidency than sign abortion into law. <laughs> the two great tragedies of the last years are the fall of the Eighth Amendment in Ireland and then the fall of Argentina as a pro-life country. And I, I know a lot of pro-life activists in Argentina. I interviewed a lot of their strategists. 
And they had just succeeded two times consecutively. Again, the parole boards just kept on pushing, kept on pushing. And they said the new president managed to persuade just a handful of votes to undo all of that work. And now we're told once again that Argentina is pro-abortion. The feminists managed to have a rally in Argentina in defense of legalization where they brought out 72,000 people. And when I read that, I'm like, that is a very big crowd. 72,000 people is not a small crowd. And then the pro-lifers, the blue wave movement they're called, the blue wave movement held their own day of pro-life protests. Guess how many people they got out? Three million. Whoa. The drone footage of the crowds. There's just a drone flying for minutes and there's just a sea of blue. I used to watch the video whenever I was in a bad mood. I'm like, what, what must it be like to be in the middle of a crowd like that and nobody hates babies for as far as the eye can see? Let me give you a couple of other examples because when Argentina fell, the mainstream media and the abortion activists were saying this is going to start a domino effect now, like uh, you know Ireland and Northern Ireland. We're going to see all the surrounding countries following suit. But in fact, the reverse of this happened. Other countries saw what happened in Argentina, and they began to put in even stronger protections for preborn children to make sure that it wasn't going to boil down to a handful of Senate votes. So, for example, this is my favorite example, actually. Uh, the Congress of Honduras passed a shield against abortion in Honduras amendment to the Constitution last year by a margin of 88 to 28. And this shield against abortion in Honduras, I love it when they just put that right in the title. It basically puts the threshold of votes necessary to legalize abortion so high that it's impossible to do ever. Pretty much nobody can get that many votes together. We saw the same thing in the Dominican Republic, where in response to pushes for legalization, they too inserted a constitutional amendment in their constitution declaring life a right inviolable from conception until death in a vote of 128 to 34. Two attempts since to undermine that have not actually worked. We've seen the same thing, of course, in Chile which was extremely encouraging, where over 60% of voters rejected this year by a wide margin a pro-abortion constitution that we were reliably informed was about to pass, actually, by a wide margin. In March, the president of Guatemala declared his country a pro-life capital. This is a couple of years after they were pushing to loosen restrictions on abortion and 25,000 angry pro-lifers marched on the capital. The politicians were so scared they pulled the bill. The footage from that was particularly fun to watch also. I'll give you a European example that some of you may have heard of. But it's one of my favorite examples because even people who hate monarchies and hate royal families find themselves a little bit sympathetic to the concept when they hear about Liechtenstein. Some of you may know what I'm talking about. In 2012, there was a referendum held to legalize abortion in Liechtenstein. And Prince Alois, who was a devout Catholic, announced that he would be exercising his never used royal veto if the people voted in favor of abortion. And so, as a result, the referendum came out with a decision against abortion. And the abortion activists, predictably, were really angry about this. And so they hosted another referendum to take away his right of royal veto. In response, Liechtensteiners voted at a rate of 76% to uphold his royal veto. <laughs> Couple of other examples since Argentina. Last year, for the second time in four years, the pro-lifers in El Salvador have staved off legalization. On September 17, 2019, the National Assembly of Ecuador voted to retain protections for babies in the womb. And what we're seeing across Latin and South America now is an increasingly professionalized movement that has interlocking connections between all of Latin and South America, and the stuff they're doing there is absolutely incredible. Sometimes you need to see the threat in order to mobilize properly, and what we're seeing is they're watching what's going on in the West, and they're saying, not here. And then, of course, further north, the U.S. has, for the first time in just under 50 years, declared that it is not a constitutional right. Now, it's fair to say that the last 30 years have not been an improvement on our civilization, but I think the examples I just cited, 
of what defiance can accomplish are very illustrative. And I think that nowhere, nowhere I could give this speech except in Ireland should people be able to understand a legacy of defiance and what defiance can accomplish when persistence and perseverance are embarked on. Because no nation has a defiant history that is quite as glorious as Ireland does. It's one of the reasons I love to visit here. And that's also embodied in the story of the pro-life movement and the pro-life movement which saved a quarter of a million lives. I want to close by telling you a story that really highlights what you accomplished and what we all have left to fight for. Uh, quite a few years ago, it's actually the conference where I first met pro-life activists from Ireland. I was giving a speech on the history of social reform and how pro-lifers could use victim imagery to wake people up to the reality of what abortion actually was. So we were talking about William Wilberforce and the horrible slave imagery he used, Lewis Hine and the photographs of beleaguered child laborers, why pictorial evidence must be used in the court of public opinion as the best evidence that atrocities are occurring just outside our line of sight. And I've known for years that there are many pro-life activists in the U.S. who will go to the dumpsters behind abortion clinics to rescue the babies that are tossed there so that they can give them a proper burial and a proper funeral. I've gone through dumpsters myself. I've been at funerals for aborted babies. One dumpster by itself carried 80 of them in three bags. And he, a young man came up to me and says, I have something that I really want to show you. And I said yes, and I didn't really think about what he might want to show me. He was telling me these stories of going behind these dumpsters, and I, and I knew about this because I'm friends with a couple of pro-life activists who actually do that quite regularly. And we got to his house, and he handed me a jar. It's about this big. And in the jar was a tiny baby boy. And he was perfectly formed. And your brain doesn't really know how to react to seeing a baby in a jar. The sentence itself doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? And I actually kind of turned the jar around to figure out what was wrong with him, and that's when I saw that the back of his head had been caved in. That's where the abortionist had killed him. And I put the jar down on the table, and on the lid of the jar were two things. And for some reason, those two things really struck me. One of them was the name of the abortionist who had killed him, and the other was the name of the clinic where he had died. And I don't know how many hundreds, if not thousands of times, I and my colleagues and pro-lifers everywhere have been told, why don't you care about real people? Why don't you care about real children who are here? Why don't you do something for real orphans? And I remember thinking, is anybody in our society more orphaned than somebody so cut off from his natural family that the only things we know about him are the name of the person who killed him and the name of the place where he died. Nobody is more orphaned than that. Nobody is more abandoned than that. And nobody needs our help as badly as a baby scheduled to die at an abortion clinic, whether it be in Canada, in Ireland, or elsewhere. Dr. Monica Miller once said that babies have the right to life, we all know that, but babies also have the right to our defense. And that is something we need to keep at the forefront of our mind. Babies have the right to our defense, not just the right to life. Second story I'll tell you that contrasts this one so much. I remember uh, there was an outreach done, this was in, in Calgary, Alberta. And my colleagues were out, it was pouring rain. We had signs showing what abortion does to a baby. And the young woman came by, she took a pamphlet, crumpled it up, put it in her purse. She kept on thinking about that pamphlet, pulling it out again and again. It showed what abortion actually does to a baby. She delayed her appointment at the local abortion clinic. And then finally she canceled it. She came to our office about six or seven months after the baby was born. And I got to hold this gorgeous little boy and he put his fat hands on my face. And I still have the sensory memory of what it felt like to feel that little boy in the jar bumping against the sides. And that contrast with the little boy grabbing my face, no feeling topped it until I held my first daughter for the first time. 
I remember being at a conference once on a panel with Dr. Monica Miller. I've quoted her twice because she's so brilliant. And somebody asked her, help us understand the magnitude of what abortion is for a moment. And she thought for just a second and she said, where do you put 60 million bodies? Where do you put 21,000 bodies? That is what has been lost. But I want to end by posing another question to you, the ones who fought for it. Where do you put 250,000 baby girls and baby boys who are alive because of what all of you have done over these past more than 35 years? Those are the sons, daughters, cousins, friends. They're everywhere. Irish society looks the way that it does because of all of the work that you have done. If you walk down any mainstream Canadian city, you will walk for hours and you will never see anybody who has Down syndrome. I never saw the faces that were missing from the crowd in my country until I came to yours. Where do you put 250,000? That is what you did, and those are who we must fight for. I want to close with a few of my favorite lines from Alfred Tennyson to remind us all once again that the fight is worth it and that what has been accomplished is so important. The long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Thank you.